on mermaids. Before I stopped believing in mermaids at age seven or so, I'd already grown bored of and annoyed by people's jokes about Christopher Columbus and his Indians. Yes, I get it. The indigenous people of the Americas are not from India. Everyone has understood this for centuries. Please stop trying to make new jokes about it. I found every one of those jokes cheap and unfunny when I was eight. A. Can we really expect better nomenclature from a guy who believed in mermaids? On January 9th, 1493, when Columbus was 40 years old, he told everyone he saw a mermaid while sailing around the Dominican Republic, although he did seem to be depressed by its appearance, explaining that it was, quote, not half as beautiful as they are painted. Columbus is a guy from whom one should expect the word Indian to be used. B. Indian was not the only racial misnomer that can be credited to Christopher Columbus. He also messed up the names of specific West Indian tribes. The Carib tribe, for example, C-A-R-I-B, think Caribbean, pirates of that. Instead of calling them that, Columbus referred to them as the Canib tribe. And when he came to believe that they dined on fellow humans, his mispronunciation entered the culinary vernacular, cannibal. Fast forward the New World clock to the 17th century, and we find John Smith penning out his memoirs. These are famous for his fictions, which he asserted to be true, about Pocahontas. Pocahontas wasn't even her name. It was an Algonquian word that meant frisky and mischievous. Uh, her real name was Matawaka, and just about no part of her story was true. Elsewhere in these true memoirs, Smith, like Columbus, reported sightings of both cannibals and mermaids. Smith's cannibals were a bunch of women who wanted to have their way with him, and his mermaid gave him, quote, the first pangs of love. I bring this up because if mermaids existed, eating them would seem a little bit cannibalistic. If one can trust the paintings Columbus refers to, their anatomy resembles ours a little bit too much. At least their anatomy of their upper bodies, eating their tails might be more acceptable. But it makes me wonder, what would mermaid meat taste like? The intuitive assumption is that it would taste like a person, which would make this an easy question to answer. According to the non-carib cannibals of the modern world, people supposedly taste like pork. In October 2007, while being interviewed in his prison cell, the German cannibal Armin Mivis described the flavor of human being meat. Quote, the flesh tastes like pork, a little bit more bitter, stronger. It tastes quite good. His unnecessary use of the word quite tells me he's an idiot, but his description is consistent with the stories, which could be urban legends, of people in the 1920s who were selling human meat to unsuspecting diners as pork. Karl Danke, a Polish cannibal, was apparently pickling his before pawning it in the Wrocław market. But the German cannibals, Karl Grossmann and Fritz Harman, were a bit less adulterating in their product, though Grossmann was apparently pumping his meat into a hot dog stand. It seems appropriate, uh, at least compared to cannibal or Indian, that the edible version of us has come to be called long pig. But I don't think mermaids could taste like the long pig of the sea. They would have to taste like fish, even if you're eating one of their bosoms, which they probably wouldn't have because name another fish that has tits. The mermaid seems to be the only well-breasted tenant of the seas, as supported by the famous English explorer Henry Hudson. On June 15th, 1608, he reported a mermaid sighting, and in his description, mentioned a set of pendulous breasts. But that doesn't make any sense. If Hudson's mermaid lived in the ocean, she was probably cold-blooded, so there wouldn't be any insulating fat, and the fat that was there probably wouldn't be saturated, because fish don't tend to carry saturated stores like pigs and cows and people do. Open up a trout, and you're not going to find hunks of marbled meat. There will just be a bunch of unsaturated fat, which can't really be formed into the shape of breasts, certainly not perky ones. So one thing we can be pretty sure of is that mermaids wouldn't have a bosom for Hudson's dinner plate. The unsaturated fat also oxidizes faster, turning into rancid, fishy-smelling fatty acids much sooner than its saturated equivalent. And that's part of the reason leaving uncooked fish scraps in the trash results in terrible-smelling trash the next morning far worse than if it were just beef bits left in there overnight. Another reason for that smell is the diet of all mermaid-sized marine life. If you live in the ocean, what is your diet going to consist of? Probably the resource that's most abundant, 
fish, just whole fish. There isn't a culinary school where you learn how to gut those fish and fillet them and pan sear specific cuts or whatever. You're underwater. You're just going to eat the whole thing raw. It's swimming, and then you swallow it. I hate to spoil the magic, but that's how a mermaid would feed. That's proper etiquette at the aquatic dinner table. So the digestive system has to be equipped with enzymes that can break down whole live fish. And then what do you think happens when the mermaid dies? Let's say she dies of old age or head trauma, definitely not breast cancer. Once she's dead, those digestive enzymes, which are there to break down entire fish, won't wait too long before they get started digesting the whole creature that once employed them. So you probably wouldn't want to leave the mermaid scraps in the trash overnight. Although the amines and, and ammonia generated during the decomposition can be counteracted by acid. So if you just sprinkle lemon juice into your garbage, you can probably settle the pungency a little bit. But the reason you'd need that lemon juice, the reason the mermaid would break down so fast, isn't just her enzymes. It's also because of her skeletal muscle properties. The same qualities that make marine life cook so much faster than a ham hock help hasten its decomposition. And these are the exact qualities that would make a mermaid taste much more like a mackerel than a long pig. First, the ocean simulates a zero-gravity environment. There's no stress of maintaining a posture against the weight of the world. So aquatic creatures don't need a bunch of connective tissue all over the place. The cartilage and, and thick bands of ligaments and all that scaffolding around the muscles and tendons, keeping them contained and assisting in postural support, all of that. Aquatic creatures don't need that. Second, fish aren't endurance athletes. They aren't a bunch of Lance Armstrongs. They're Usain Bolts. They don't chase prey for 20 miles. They dart at it from 20 feet. You don't have to be a mobile spectator to witness the entire dance, the attack, the getaway. It all happens in about the size of a public pool. And it seems unlikely that mermaids would be an arbitrary random exception to this. So the muscles would be composed of almost purely type 2 fibers. These are the fast twitch fibers, the white meat. And type 2 fibers don't have a lot of connective tissue inside of them because they don't have to be recruited over and over and over. In an electrical sense, that's not even something they can do. Repetition is not on their resume. So they don't need all of that girder structure that a marathon runner needs to withstand 20,000 foot strikes. Endurance fibers need the support of connective tissue inside the fiber. The type 2s don't. They just load up with contractile protein so they can generate more force, so they can explode across those 20 feet. And this is why mermaid steaks would not be all gristly like a ribeye or a porterhouse. They wouldn't have all that connective tissue outside or inside the muscle. That's why you wouldn't need a knife to cut it. You could just use a spoon. Now, the flavor, I'm not sure about. Columbus apparently spotted his mermaid around the Dominican Republic, presumably around the coral reef, where a lot of tropical fish take up residence, including the pork fish, which, like the mermaid, could not possibly taste like pork. Most of these fish, at least those that hover around the reef, are actually poisonous from ingesting too many dinoflagellates, so you wouldn't want to eat them anyway. The mermaid would probably be smart enough to dine at a distance, maintaining an edible physique, but even the species you can eat in this area would be better served as fish and chips, that bland, tasteless meat that won't sell a plate on its own. So my hunch is, most mermaids would wind up being served in those restaurants that have captain's wheels hung all over the walls. Lower middle class Americans would sit down in a plastic booth, pay $12 for a basket of breaded mermaid meat, and dip it in tartar sauce as a lubricant to swallow it, while looking out the submarine style window wondering what werewolf meat would taste like. For anyone hoping to enjoy a mermaid without the batter and the fries, it would be in need of some serious spices, and that is where Columbus might redeem himself, if we ever found his less than beautiful maiden of the sea. Perhaps then, and perhaps only then, I would forgive his coinage of the Indian and the cannibal. CourtneyJensen.com